Hello, everyone. Welcome back to our Friday meetings. Uh, I am Michael Troisi, the current president of HackUCF. So we're going to get started today with our meeting. So uh, one of the things you can do during the entirety of this meeting is visit our sign-in form. This is something that SGA wants us to do to keep track of our active student members. And what that means essentially is that you can now vote in our elections when the time does come. Um, that's really one of the only benefits to be an active student member. So if you're interested in getting that participation or audio, uh, what's the word, attendance tract, this is how you do that uh, for the semester. Uh, here is our various social media platforms. Uh, one of the things we do have is a mailing list. Um, we send out a newsletter every week with information about our workshop and the current talks that we do every Friday. If you wanna get emails on those, uh, feel free to sign your email up. We also have a shop new to us this year. Um, we do have lots of apparel on there like masks, pins, t-shirts, stuff like that. Uh, we did push two new mask designs up on the store. So if you're still in the market for buying masks, there is one now in red and one in blue. So that's pretty cool if you like that kind of thing. And as always, we do have our Discord server. Uh, you can visit it at hackucf.org slash discord. That's where all of our members hang out and we uh, socialize, get to know each other a little bit. We can't exactly hang out on campus. So this is the next best thing to talk with all of our members. And we do have a Twitter uh, where we do tweet out announcements for some of the meetings we're doing now and a bit of workshops. And we, we advertise a lot of our stuff on that. And following that, we'll go ahead and go into today's topics. So first thing, as always, we're going to hit us, uh, us uh, announce uh, the things going on this week in the form of the announcements. Then we'll move to current events with Tupperware. Uh, then we'll do tool time. It's going to be on chocolatey with myself. And then move on to the main talk, uh, Windows sus subsystem for Linux, also by myself. And then we'll go ahead and close things out. So. Um, Every week, we do have an operations meeting. Those are Monday at 7.30 p.m. Uh, Eastern time zone. Uh, they will be hosted on Zoom, and the links for those are distributed on our web courses, on our Discord, and on our public calendar as well. So you can find those in various places, and they're open to anyone. Uh, the main purpose of these meetings is to help us plan the Friday meetings, such as the one today, and any workshops that we want to do over the, the weekends. Uh, we have those every Saturday. So today we're gonna to be announcing, um, we've got stuff for Pegasec, which is a cyber expo thing that InfoSec does. Um, Hack the Vote and MetaCTF are both CTF competitions that you can participate in. Uh, and then we'll go and talk about our t-shirt and hoodie design competition, which is something that we are doing this year. Uh, we didn't do it last year, so we're gonna be doing it this year. And, and in conjunction with that one, there's also gonna be a budget on amend uh, uh, amendment because we do have to add some line items for those purchases to be made for the apparel stuff. So uh, we'll move it into Pegasec. Uh, this is hosted by our friends over at UCF InfoSec. Uh, in the previous years, we've collaborated with them to get that event up and running. This year in the remote style, it's a little different. There were some things they had to work out on their own. So we're not exactly hosting it ourselves by name, but we do like to advertise for them to our members um, for that event. It happens uh, every year in the month of October, which just happens to be the uh, Cybersecurity Awareness Month or something like that. Um, and this year, they're going to have virtual speakers come in um, from FBI agents, security professionals, UCF researchers, and people like that. And they also will be having a, a panel uh, on the 30th of October uh, for people such as this. And the link on screen is where you can go to register for this event and find out more information about that. Um, again, that is going to be on October 30th. Um, I think it's kind of an all day event. They have sections in the morning and in the afternoon. You can register for either one or both if, if you have the free time. Also, we are advertising a few CTFs happening this weekend. Uh, the main one we're pushing uh, this time around is the Meta CTF and Hack the Vote. Uh, that is happening on Saturday, tomorrow. Um, that is all the times posted are in UTC um, to convert to Eastern to local time, Florida, Orlando, uh, you subtract four hours. So I believe the first one happening on Saturday is the Meta CTF happening at 8 a.m. Saturday going until Sunday, 8 a.m. And all of these are Jeopardy style CTFs. So you're presented with a list of challenges of different categories. 
and you can pick and choose which challenge you want to complete. And the harder challenges are usually worth more points. And of course, all of these are going to be online. Um, if you do from your home or with a group of friends, if you want to do a team for that. Um, and of course, the other CTFs happening as well. Um, a lot of them happening on today, Friday, and Saturday for the weekend. And that's kind of those overview of that. So Hack the Vote is one of those Jeopardy CTF styles. Um, there's the official URL in there. And I'll just read the blip we have here. So ever since the Hack the Vote's debut, election security's kind of been an issue since we were investigating you know, voting digitally and stuff like that. So this year, Hack the Vote 2020, the CTF will fall a couple weekends before the major US electoral contest. So you can practice poning, reversing web and things like that in a in the democratic process. So it's kind of, I think, emulating the format of a technology behind digital voting and stuff like that. And of course the meta CTF as well, another Jeopardy CTF. Um, it's free and open for everyone to, to participate. Um, you will be able to have a team of up to four people and there will be separate scoreboards for those students and those non-students. And as you can see here, as always, it's just Jeopardy style. So there are different categories for CTFs. So you have web exploitation, cryptography, binary exploitation, reverse engineering, all that fun stuff. Again, these CTFs are open to a lot of people. So there is no requirement that you feel the need to kind of have as a prerequisite before going into this. It's a learning opportunity and a great place to socialize. So even if you're not confident in your CTF abilities, we do encourage you to even show up that is something you can have on your resume that you partake in CTFs. You don't have to do very well in them for people to take notice. You just have to have the willpower to show up and want to learn more. Yeah, just have fun and hack things. That's what it's all about. It, it's a very much a social event, uh, especially during this time when we can't exactly be the most social as we used to be. So this is something to network with people and, and get to know and build your skills. And then not this weekend, but next weekend, there are four more CTFs here. Uh, again, all times are in UTC. And we will re-announce these as the time approaches. So happening next Friday and next Saturday. But of course, the main ones will be happening tomorrow. So the Meta CTF, look into that and uh, uh, register your team for that one. So uh, after all those CTFs, uh, let's move on to the hoodie stuff. So we didn't do it last year. We had a, a lot of extra shirts from previous years. So people wanted a new design. So we're going ahead and get that done this year. So what we're gonna do is host a t-shirt and hoodie design competition. So we have in the past done a hoodie, we've in the past done a t-shirt. Uh, this year we're doing both at the same time. So what does that mean? Uh, it's open right now, actually, the competition, and we'll go into more details on this in a future slide. But you have about a month, uh, Thursday the 19th uh, at midnight, I believe, to submit designs for a t-shirt or a hoodie that's something you design as a member. You're, you're welcome to design and submit these for all of our members to have a new t-shirt or hoodie for this year. Um, in a previous year, we've had this happen. I'm wearing one of those right now. Uh, if it doesn't come out on camera, this is a Hack UCF shield, but in ASCII. So if you look real close to ASCII characters, and of course the actor's name, name underneath that. So that's kind of some of the designs we've had. There's been play on logos, there's been custom stuff. And it's really, you can get really creative on how you wanna do this. So we also will be providing these two templates uh, on screen so you can help visualize the kind of um, design that would look like on the actual product. And I'll move on to the next slide with those templates filled in with uh, mock-up images. Um, you don't have to use it exactly as it is here, um, but it is provided to you for display purposes on that meeting. So here's some of the restrictions around that. Those templates and our Hack UCF logos that you can incorporate into your design are available on our website at hackucf.org slash search. That's going to just bring you to a zip file where you can download these logos and templates to your computer and work with those. Um, if you are interested in submitting a design or you have any questions about that or want to talk about the, the design competition or stuff like that, um, please email shirts at hackucf.org. And that's also the same email you will use to submit the final documents for that. And of course, please don't use any copyrighted material or trademark material without written approval from the actual owner of that. Uh, we will be giving these out to people and there will be some change of money to get this stuff done so we can exactly benefit from someone else's work. And of course, keep it PG, I say, 
I suppose, no profanity and stuff like that, it probably won't get through the final rounds of voting for that. Um, so what we would like to receive from everyone who would like to participate is a, it's recommended that you use a design with at least a resolution on screen, 4,500 pixels by 50, 90 pixels at the NGDPI, all that technical stuff. We would like to receive them in a vector graphic format so that way we can store them for archival and have a record of that for us. And also when we upload it to the print manufacturer, we can scale it up and down if needed. Um, if you're unable to do the vector images, that's fine. We also accept a high resolution PNG file that we can just upload straight to them. Uh, we just prefer the vector because it normally comes out with higher quality. But if you can produce a high enough um, PNG format, that's just fine. Um, and this will not be the first time we have about this. We'll be announcing it at future meetings. We're also in the Discord. We can ask more information about this. Um, we're just announcing this today. So there's no rush to get any design done. Um, again, it will be closing Thursday, the 19th of November. You're welcome to submit designs uh, to that email, search at acucf.org, before that deadline. If there's an issue with the design, like we can't open the file, or it's not compatible with our software, or not compatible with the print provider, we can let you know about that, and you can have extra time, not extra time in the competition, but you will still have the remainder of the competition window to submit a improved design or one that is compatible. But unfortunately, after that date, we will not be accepting any changes or new submissions, just that everyone has the same time to work on this. And you won't just be doing this for the sake of designing something. You will also be getting prizes if you are the winning design. So for the t-shirt design, um, if the design you chose and designed is favored by um, the members and voted on, um, you'll be receiving a Raspberry Pi starter kit uh, with the Raspberry Pi 4, 4 gigabyte model B version. Um, and the starter kit comes with all that fun stuff on screen. Um, this is just an incentive to get people to really come up creative, with creative designs and encourage members to partake in this, in this nice event that we have. And of course, you will also get a t-shirt of the winning lot. So if the design you win is, if the design you created does win the competition, you then get a copy of that shirt and this Raspberry Pi starter kit. And something similar we also have for the hoodie design. Uh, not exactly the same prize, but slightly different. It is going to be an Arduino um, starter kit. So on top of the Arduino, it comes with all that stuff on screen, LEDs, fun hardware hacking stuff. Um, and yeah, this is going to be just awarded to you as well as the hoodie if there's going to be one. So um, someone asked, how many designs are we allowed to submit? Uh, I think in the past we've limited it to one because otherwise then you're just able to get multiple um, like ballots on the, on the ballot. So please restrict it to just one design. And of course, any questions about this can be emailed to shirts at xgf.org and we can work with you on answering questions and more technical details about file formats and sizes. Um, beyond whatever was in here, if that's helpful. So um, we also are going to need to, of course, amend, amend the budget for this purchase of those prizes. It was not in the initial budget approval. Um, we just didn't plan that far ahead, unfortunately, to purchase these these uh, these prizes. So those are the cost values estimated on screen. We'll, we'll uh, add a line item for $300 to purchase those two items. Um, and in addition to that, specifically for the prizes, we will also be adding a line item to the hoodies. Um, the hoodies are going to be a bulk purchase by us. So we will have to accept prepayment from members who are interested. So how that works out is you will request a RSVP of a hoodie. We will then accept payment from you. And then once we've accepted everyone's payment, we will then use that money to bulk order these hoodies. Um, the hoodies are much more expensive than the t-shirts because they are a completely different product, of course. So it's not something you want to take out of pocket. So we will collect um, dues for that, payments for that, and then collect the, and then buy the hoodies in bulk, exactly what was purchased, and then distribute up to our members um, that way. So we would need a buffer budget in the, um, a buffer line item in the budget to do that. So, yep, and that's my price. You can view the budget at hackucf.org slash budget. Uh, Jeffrey also posted a link in the Zoom chat you can view. And I believe Addison also has the actual voting for this, which you can do as an active student member. Um, so we should drop that somewhere, I think. I think it's going to be in the Discord. I have myself muted, so I can't see it. But it should be there. Um, 
we'll announce that at the end of this meeting. So please go ahead and vote on that. Excuse me. And this Saturday at noon, we will be having a workshop on reverse engineering basics uh, led by Zori in Discord. Um, I believe his current nickname is Stacked now. And he will go over reverse engineering. If you're not familiar with reverse engineering, what does that mean? Essentially, it is taking a compiled program or a finished program and trying to figure out how it works at the code level. So we've all, uh, if you've taken CS1 or a programming class, you know you write some code, then you compile it into a binary. What reverse engineering does is try to get that binary back into the code. Um, it's not a straightforward process exactly. Um, you, uh, uh, he will be using the binary Ninja cloud platform, which does have a feature that tries to bring the binary back to code as much as it can. So you can figure out how the binary works and exploit it even. You can find vulnerabilities in the bug, like a buffer overflow, if input's not being sanitized correctly. Those are some things you can identify. And this is a great workshop to learn how programs work under the hood. Or if you're interested in doing CTFs, there is a reverse engineering or pwning aspect of those CTFs. So if you're interested in that kind of things, uh, please do attend that workshop tomorrow. I think it's gonna be very interesting. And as always, we do have the virtual cyber lab in our discord. It's just a virtual cyber lab channel. Uh, come hang out, socialize, play games, um, generally hang out. It's open 24 seven. It is in the discord server. So feel free to jump in at any time. Um, we got plenty of people in the server. And so we've got a lot of downtime. So uh, I think it's been enough of me talking for now. So let's move on to current events uh, with Tupperware. Hey, can you guys hear me okay? Yes, we can. Cool. All right, current events. I don't have control of the slides, but I'll just tell you when next slide. So let's go. So uh, there was a French IT company that got hit with uh, Ryuk ransomware, which is uh, ransomware that was used to uh, hit uh, the UHS back in late September. Uh, to give you an idea of the size of this French IT company, they have 46,000 employees in 25 different countries. Uh, and it got a pretty big portion of their network encrypted. Uh, there's not much more information right now about this, but it's, it's really, really bad. So we go to the next slide. Cool. So if you guys have NVIDIA graphics cards, uh, I'd recommend you update your drivers because uh, you, they had some insecure code where they weren't controlling some search paths when loading some web server uh, modules. And it leads your computer uh, open to uh, DOS attacks. Uh, and I'm just looking at chat real quick. I have no idea. Oh, so actually, yeah, you can go back real quick one slide. Uh, I'll like talk about this real quick. So like Ryu is kind of like, um, I saw one person describe them as just kind of like a group that creates ransomware for people to use. So I think, I think that what happened is someone paid them to make them ransomware and then they use the ransomware to get this French IT company. So that's kind of like what happened there. Okay, so you can go back to the other slide and I'll continue. I was talking about with NVIDIA. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, if your uh, computer gets hacked with this exploit, with this web server uh, module exploit, uh, the attacker gets a reverse shell uh, at, escalated, at escalated privileges and can pretty much do whatever they want to your machine. Uh, so update your drivers if you haven't done it yet. All right, next slide. Uh, oh, so uh, some more ransomware stuff just because I felt this topic kind of linked up with the other two. Um, there's, uh, there's a new, new, I put an extra new in there. Uh, there's new ransomware uh, that uh, is a Trojan that allows remote access uh, to your machine. Um, and uh, they're in this ransom note, template, uh, there contains a filler for ransomware with comments and proof of concepts of how this will work. And if it gets out, um, it's suspected to get out through something like Discord, because uh, Discord has been known in the past for uh, some other similar hacks. 
um, but it'll uh, pretty quickly take your Chrome cookies and other information that it saves, um, see Steam credentials and list of all of the games you have installed. And of course, Discord information, file listings, and some basic system information that isn't necessarily private anyway. Uh, but it's kind of crazy that they can just rip it out in a matter of uh, in a very short time, very short time. So that's just something to, to keep in mind. So keep your stuff updated. Um, the problem uh, with Discord would be if some if someone uses this ransomware and then modifies Discord to have the ransomware in it and then distribute that around as like their own Discord with the ransomware installed. So just you know make sure you get your programs from reputable sources and whatnot. Um, you can stay safe from this stuff. And that's all I got for current events, guys. Kept it short for you. All right, thank you, Tupperware. So we'll go ahead and uh, hand it back off to uh, myself for the tool time in the beginning of my uh, my sprint today. So <laughs> let me get that video back on and we'll move on to the tool time for Chocolatey. So what exactly is Chocolatey? Uh, may, many of you may not have heard of this technology before or the software even. So what it is, it is the package manager for Windows. So similar to Linux, how you can app install things and on other distros you can use apt or yum or pacman and stuff like that. Uh, this is that for Windows. And that's the URL for it if you wanna look that up and install it yourself while we go through this demo. So what a package manager is, it is essentially a, it's a program on your computer that allows you to manage installed software and packages and easily update them, remove them, install them without having to go through a uh, the website to then download that install and go through the whole process. Um, and this will hopefully make more sense once I actually get into the demo itself, um, which is now. So let me go ahead and switch over to the um, VM that I have without chocolatey. So give me, I'll actually open up Hyper-V real quick, which is on a VM. One second. And we'll get started with this. So I will full screen it. Let me know if it does not show up fully, um, but it should. Uh, just one second. Yeah, it's a pretty quick, but we got plenty of time. Don't worry about that. <clears throat> second. All right, this is the VM I have of Windows to kind of experiment with and install a bunch of stuff on. Uh, it's very angry with me at certain things because uh, when you poke at Windows enough times, it stops working. So does this come through on the Zoom call just fine? The full screen virtual machine? Uh, yeah. All right, cool, thank you. So, oh no, okay. So I'll go through the entire process of Chocolatey installing it and then showing you how to use it. It is a fairly simple program, so I might as well go through the installation process as well. Uh, so uh, get over to chocolatey.org and you just go ahead and install it now. Uh, it's fairly simple. You just run a single PowerShell command. So I will first have to open PowerShell as administrator. And then you simply copy and paste this command and that's essentially all it takes to install Chocolatey. It does this by downloading a PowerShell script from their server and just running that. And it's, it's basically that simple. So hopefully it does work. So it seems to be finished. So I'll verify that by running the Choco command, which is what we have and it is installed. So I can verify that. So now that I have the Choco um, package measure installed, we can begin using it just to install packages that easy. So if I wanna, we can actually browse those by going to the community and browsing their community packages. Um, yeah, yeah, I understand. And these are just some of the like favorite packages or alphabetical packages that they do have. Uh, they've got, what is it? 7,000 packages to install. So things like Adobe Reader, uh, Google Chrome or Flash Player, if you really wanted to for some reason in the current year, uh, Firefox, 7-Zip Notepad, even Visual Studio Code, um, all that cool stuff. So how do we actually go about using that? So let's say I wanted to install Adobe Acrobat, but I wasn't quite sure of how to find that uh, without going to my browser. Um, I don't have it installed on this virtual machine. I do not. So what we can do is Choco uh, search, let's say Adobe Reader. Reader. And much like app, there's a search function, there's an install function. 
Um, and we do have a few of them found, um, possibly broken. This one's been approved, but it's for licensed users or uh, changed by vendor, or something like that. But that's an update. Uh, here we have Adobe Reader. Uh, that one's approved. Is this terminal large enough to see, by the way? I think it should come in full screen and stuff. Should be good. Uh, looks fine. Okay, cool. Thank you. So if I want to install Adobe Reader, I would just run choco install Adobe Reader, right? Fairly simple command. And it downloads that package for me and will even run some scripts to get that installation process done. So this one says, hey, the package wants to run this install script. If you don't run this script, the installation will fail. So I guess if I want to continue, it would be helpful to allow this script. And I will click uh, Y to then continue installing that. And it should take just a minute to download that and dive on the next script. I will click A to just say run all the scripts rather than ask me for every single one. It's then going through this and running automation scripts to get these installed for me without me having to go to Adobe's website to download Adobe, install it, go through the graphical installation wizard and all that stuff. So yep. I'm not sure how long this will take, but it should be fairly quick. Um, they do have a lot of software on here. You can browse the packages and I've even been surprised with some of the software they do have. Like they even have some like server administration tools on here. Uh, for like your Windows servers, if you want to install Chocolate on that, which is very interesting. No JS installer. Nice. Maybe Adobe was a large one, but uh, we'll see just how long this takes to, to go. Um, I think in my practice, it didn't take that long, so we will see. But what Chocolate does use is a Sometimes it's able to use the native installer. Other times it is a custom wrapper around that that doesn't install it. So it doesn't exactly install them as containers or anything. It actually puts them straight on your host machine as you would any other software. Uh, I don't know why this one's taking forever uh, because it's on camera, it's shy, I guess. Took like a minute last time I tried it the other day, but that's uh, how it works, I guess. Hopefully Adobe can work. I'll show you what's installed and then I'll do other things and quickly remove it as well and remove those packages. So I'll give it a minute before I try something else. It won't take that long. Uh, there we go. Uh, it now installed it. It's checking hashes, making sure everything's legit, everything's good. Um, and it should finish up in just a second. So Using this at scale is much easier than going to multiple deployments or multiple websites, downloading the software you need and getting it done manually. Because this is also an easy way to keep software up to date. Because once this is installed and a new version comes out, I can just uh, choco update Adobe Reader and it does this process again and updates it to the newest version. Um, you can like, script this out and use it as a deployment tool. Um, uh, another thing like this, something similar to setting up new machines is Ninite. I believe that's the name of it. It basically is a single binary that lets you customize what programs you want installed and will kind of install them for you. I don't know why the virtual machine today is being as slow as it is. Um, it's, it's shy, I guess. Oh, things are flashing on screen. I guess that means progress is happening. Uh, I may not install other software because it takes forever, but uh, let's see if it did pop up. So Adobe Reader DC is new, it's installed. And there we go. It finally installed three packages. So Adobe Reader, it's very simple even. Uh, it's installed, it's the newest version. I can then say uh, Choco uninstall. Uh, if you wanna be fun with it, you can uh, make a new alias. Uh, I'll call this one name. I'll now install apt on Windows and uh, commit a sin, right? So value Choco. All right, so I can apt uh, update. And that's a valid command now. Um, so apt install 7-zip. Uh, and that app, not to confuse you, that's completely an alias. I did it uh, just to be a meme, I guess. So I'll install 7-zip as well. Was not on this machine before. Uh, it's a package manager. It does basically that simple. So 7-zip installed much faster. 7-zip um, is now on the machine. Very simple. Uh, and I'll just uninstall. So Choco uninstall 7-zip. 
Yes, on, on the on installation script and seven zips now uninstalled. So on Linux, it's very easy to do this with apt and stuff like that. Um, install remove software uh, much quicker, but now there's an equivalent to this on, on Windows. Choco has been out for a while. It's not something many people are aware of, but if you do often like to install software or like a single interface to manage all of that, um, this is kind of the, the place to do it. And it's, uh, I think it's pretty neat, pretty cool. Um, does anyone have any questions about this? Yeah, it is pretty cool. If you need to install something that's like, oh, I can't find the download for it, or you know, it's too complicated to install, or you're just lazy, you know. Ten out of ten. Would it chocolate again? Another thing I can do, I suppose, which would surprise me to segue into the main talk, I think I can choco install WSL. And it does. I don't know what it does, like exactly, but I'll go through the manual process as well. Okay. So it's installing uh, WSL. Okay, I have WSL now. Uh, can I? I have bash now. Okay, I'll get into that later. That's interesting. Okay, so we'll go ahead and close that. Yeah, too easy. I'll close that and uh, kill this and move back onto the uh, main talk stuff. So that was the live demo. And I'll move on to the introduction to WSL. Um, so today's main talk is going to be introduction to that uh, WSL that I just installed and kind of what it's all about. Um, so uh, it is the Windows system for Linux. Um, to get this installed on your computer, the version one at least, it does require the anniversary update or later. Um, that's going to be version 1607 uh, for your Windows. And I'll show you how to check Windows versions um, later. And what that is, is it allows you to run Linux applications on your Windows computer. And I'll explain more how that works, but it is very useful for development or an alternative use case even for virtual machines. If you have a special tool you need to run, um, like let's say you want to install Docker, uh, it's sometimes more difficult to do that with um, on Windows. It does require dependencies, but of course you can use something like Choco, install Docker, and it should just do that work for you on Windows. But what if you want to use the Linux version or you want to easily install apt install nginx or something like that, and you don't have Choco on your Windows computer, or you want to have a development environment for those tools, um, that's great for this. Um, after WSL1 was released, Microsoft did release a WSL2 version um, that does require a later build of Windows version 1903, build 18362. And again, I'll show more details on that later. So what this update was very important that was like a game changer for a lot of people was that this now includes a full Linux kernel on your Windows machine. So your Windows computer has a Linux kernel uh, that improves file system performance uh, for disk IO and full system call capability. So the full system calls, it, system calls are things that open files, allocate memory, um, form network connections, uh, stuff like that, that the computer does under the hood. Uh, you can now do that natively with the Linux way rather than an emulation layer of WSL version one. And those system calls really open up the possibilities to a lot more things. So you can run things like Docker or Nmap straight from within that Linux distribution. And here's the a chart from Microsoft uh, showing two different, the different versions and kind of what the differences is. So the main benefit of WSL2, it is now a full Linux kernel and it is virtualized in a VM. It does use the Linux X4 general link file system, which is different than the Windows one. So it is basically Linux and most things you would want a VM for, it does, you know, it, it does do that. And because it is a VM and you are now running basically what is a Linux machine on your Windows machine, if you want to operate on data sets across them, so Windows to Linux or Linux to Windows, it is a bit slower, but I mostly operate with text files and stuff, so it doesn't really matter. But because you are essentially crossing virtualization boundaries, there is a emulation layer that, has, that happens there. 
So how do you run applications and use this uh, as the Linux shell? And it's basically the exact same way you would do it on a Linux machine. There is no GUI for it. Uh, like you don't get a Linux desktop like you would Ubuntu. You don't get presented with that GNOME and the taskbar and all those things. But you don't really need it because you have access to the terminal. And if you were to install graphical applications in there, um, they won't immediately work. Um, that feature is coming officially by Microsoft. I believe they called it Wayland. Uh, they want to integrate that into Windows. So you can run Linux graphical applications on, I'm sorry, did I say Linux graphical applications on your Windows computer? Um, that official support is not here yet, but you can go ahead and do that now without Microsoft because you can make an easy change to the distribution and run those uh, applications yourself on Windows. So that can be set up by running your own X window system on Windows. Um, and I believe the next slide mentions that, yes. So the way that most Unix distributions work is to display applications is it does so by using an X server. So right now we're on X11 and it's been that way for quite some time. Um, and it operates on a client server model. So the client in this case is going to be an application that sends the data to the server. And the server is going to be your monitor essentially, or the server, the software running on your monitor to display those UI elements. It doesn't manage the UI design. It simply displays those UI elements and presents them to the end user. So an example of that on the right side is a diagram of an X server deployment. So on, one, on the top, you have your user workstation where the various applications you're running, such as the web browser or the terminal are going to be represented as those X clients, which then communicate with the X server. Um, and that's going to be running on your machine. Because it is a client server base, you can actually communicate this over the network. So on a remote machine, um, and in our, in our situation, it would be the Windows, or I'm sorry, the Linux distribution running on our machine. That would be our remote machine in this case. The client will run in there and then it will send the graphical UI data and send to its local host, it would be to the X server running on my Windows machine. So what are the use cases for this? Um, of course, the most obvious one is running graphical Linux applications on your Windows host. And the second one is if I wanted to connect to a remote server, um, the SSH or a server in the cloud or something that I'm not physically present on, I can do what's called X11 forwarding and I can run a graphical application on a remote server and have it display on my local machine. Um, if you've managed Windows environments before, um, it's very ba it's basically like remote desktop or RDP to kind of just get a console, a web console on that screen. Uh, people administer Linux by doing so with a VNC server. So it's basically RDP, but a different protocol, mostly for Linux stuff. Um, but this is at the application level. So rather than screening, uh, streaming the entire application wind, uh, desktop, um, you're, you're streaming only individual applications. And with the WSL2, it comes with a bit of networking stuff as well, because it does have to emu uh, virtualize an entire Linux system on your Windows host. So when WSL2 is installed and created and does all that stuff, it operates on a virtual network adapter that is installed on your host. So what that means is every Linux distribution that you have, it's on its own internal private network that is, you don't have to operate on it. It's just useful to know how it operates under the hood. And it does that so that the Linux distributions can communicate with each other. Um, and they operate at the network level uh, separately from your Windows computer. So as here, they all share a common IP subnet. Uh, I'll go into detail, detail this, um, of course, in a demo, um, separate from the host machine. So even though you are running a virtual machine on your laptop, essentially, or on your computer, um, from the rest of the network and communications with the internet and other hosts, um, it all appears to be coming from your host machine anyway. So if you're using a web browser on your Linux, uh, I'm, so, from, I'm sorry, from your Windows host, and you run, let's say, Nmap or a ping from the Linux distribution, it will all come from the same IP address um, as far as the network you're connected to is concerned. So there's no distinction between what OS you're using these tools from. Um, and because it is run on host, Microsoft has implemented a kind of NAT redirect. So what that means is you can run applications on your Linux host as a server and connect to them from your Windows machine. And if you configure it such, you can even ask us it, access it from the rest of the network. So 
I'm just going to move to a demonstration of like all that stuff and kind of work through how WSL works, how to install it, and kind of the use cases for it. Because it's a very useful tool um, where you don't need a Linux VM anymore to run a lot of tools on Linux. So let me go ahead and move over to that. So the first thing that you need to do is first install WSL2. Um, I'll go ahead and minimize all this stuff and then that's Zoom. Okay, cool. So let me pull up the documentation for that because there's a few commands that I know, but I want to show kind of uh, how that works out. So what? So it's a very simple step. Um, if you want to do this as well, you, you like definitely can. I'll drop this link even in Zoom. So if you want to follow along, you can. Let's drop in Zoom. So I already have WSL2 installed on my computer, so I don't have to run any of these. But it's as simple as running this command to install Substance for Linux. Um, the graphical representation of this, um, also the Windows features, um, you will require Hyper-V platform, I believe. Um, that is the virtualization layer. This Hyper-V platform does require a Windows 10 edition that's not home, which uh, I'm sure many editions are. Um, UCF, as students, we do have access to license keys for Microsoft products. So if you log into portal.azure.com, I think, uh, you can go and get a Windows 10 education license for completely free, which is equivalent to the Windows 10 Enterprise Edition in all its features, which does give you access to this Hyper-V platform. Um, although I did probably, I, I believe I mis misspoke. You do not need um, the Hyper-V platform in this method to get WSL2. Uh, WSL2 is installed, uh, supported on Windows 10 Home. Um, but you probably should use this, this command instead. And the following commands kind of enable virtual machine platform, um, which should show up on Windows 10 using the commands. Um, and then of course, after you enable the virtualization platforms here, um, we'll go to Windows subsystem, subsystem for Linux and install that. Um, that takes a minute. You probably have to reboot your computer, um, but that is what you need to get started with that. Um, I believe by default, it then starts you off with WSL version one. But if you are on Windows version 8, 1903 or higher, um, you can install version two. So if you're on Windows and you want to check what version you're running and you want to, um, for software or for this use case, uh, Windows key R, run, bring up the run terminal, or just go to start and type it in. Uh, winver is the command you want, which runs up this about Windows. Um, and it does show I'm ver running version 2004, build 19041.572. Uh, version 1903 you need, uh, the number 2004 is bigger than 1903, therefore I'm on a newer version and I can run Windows Subsystem for Linux version two. Um, one of the first things you wanna do is install a Linux distribution. And you do that by going to the Microsoft store. Um, everyone's favorite store to get all their games because what is Steam, am I right? So for this one, let's say I'll install Ubuntu because I don't have that one already and it's a new install I'll go through. Um, I'll just pick the first one, um, probably the newest version. It is by Canonical. I own this app already. I've done this before. So I'll go ahead and click install. And what that does is it installs an Ubuntu distribution uh, to my laptop. And it's only 444 megabytes. It's a quick download. Uh, my internet is not that fast. Um, I don't know where it's pulling that one from. So good on you, Microsoft. Um, this is much more lightweight than a full Linux VM because it, it, uh, it's stripped down a lot. So it's far more resource uh, efficient. Um, now that I've got Ubuntu installed, I'm going to go ahead and launch Ubuntu. It's then finishing up some installation processes and it'll take a few minutes, um, but it won't. It shouldn't, it, unless it wants to because Zoom. There we go. And I was saying, please create a default Unix user account. So I've just installed um, Ubuntu and I was saying, hey, create a user. Um, I'll call this Troisi and then create a password for the user. Uh, super secure password. You'll never guess what it is. And I now have a terminal shell on bash. Uh, what was the URL you thought was? Okay. So to check for uh, Tupperware, I'll drop that in chat. I think it's portal.azure.com. I'm not sure. 
but yes, so some answer, so thank you. Um, log into that with your knights, not your knights, uh, yeah, your knights email and look for the software packages. On the hub, uh, I think is dead, unfortunately. Uh, UCF kind of killed that. There is no Microsoft licenses on there, but Azure definitely has them. I've gotten them before. Yeah. So I don't have a fully in installed Ubuntu system, uh, what took essentially a few minutes to get installed, uh, rather than go through the Linux ISO, download that, set up a VM, do all that stuff. Um, I can just get it natively on my computer. Um, so this is now WSL, right? So if I want to upgrade to WSL version two, um, which I may or may not have installed already, um, I'll open PowerShell again as administrator and I'll run the WSL command and I'll list the distros that I have uh, verbose. Uh, WSL, tac, tac, list, tac, tac, verbose, shows the installations that I have. Um, I currently have, how easy it is to, 18, there we go. All right. So I have Debian, Kali Linux, and Ubuntu installed in this box. The one I just installed is Debian. Uh, I'm sorry, Ubuntu. The star next to Debian means that's my default. So if I run WSL on the command line to get into Bash, this is a Debian installation, not the Ubuntu one. And they are different. We can exit out of that, and that's that. So WSL, um, what you would do is set the version to two. So set default version to two uh, means that any installation you do install would be of version two, but I've already done that on, on my host machine. So it won't make any changes. The virtual machine I do have set up, uh, again, Windows updates is very angry at me. So I can't update to the latest version to get WSL2. Um, I'll have to work on that some other day. But once you do that and follow these like easy steps to follow, um, even install your distribution, Ubuntu, OpenSUSE, Server, Debian, even Kali Linux is on here. Um, the Kali Linux on the Windows Store does not come with the full feature set of Kali tools. Um, probably a terms of service thing because they can't distribute malware through the shop officially. So that's probably why. But um, you can definitely install those Kali tools on that machine. Um, distribution, we've done that. You can install the Windows terminal. Um, I won't do that because it's, I'm not a huge fan of it yet. But the command we're looking for is set version, right? So we have Ubuntu installed, WSL, set version, uh, the thing, Ubuntu, they called it. So set version, Ubuntu 2 version 2. And it runs like real quick, to, depending on your system. And that gets you Windows subsystem version 2. So very simple on that. And to even run that, I just go to my start menu and run it like a program. So I have Ubuntu. I'm now in Ubuntu, right? Um, I can check my network interfaces because it's virtualized. So I do have all these interfaces. Um, ETH0, it does have a different IP than my host machine. Um, it is all virtualized, so that's how that works. Um, so if I wanted to install a, so I can do things on here, like I, I can apt install, so let me apt update real quick for sudo, because I need to be administrator or root on the next machine. So sudo su basically says run the, the command su as sudo, which is super user. So that's a, a quick way to get to root, uh, a terminal as root, now I'm root. Where am I? I'm root. So I can do an apt update to get the repositories for Ubuntu updated and get that cache to begin installing software. But we can't all have nice things because as we see, it's not working. And why is it not working? Uh, because Microsoft done broke it, I guess. So uh, that's a DNS issue with WSL. I'm going through this entire process because it is an issue you may encounter yourself. Um, it seems to be an issue on my machine across all Linux distributions. Um, but you'd have to edit the names, the, the DNS servers, which is what your computer does to get the domain names to IP addresses. So security.abutu.com, it doesn't know where that is. It tries the built-in DNS resolver fails. So I have to edit resolve.conf. Name server is just an IP of my Windows host, but my Windows host doesn't actually run DNS. So I don't know why it does that. So I'll change that to Cloudflare which is much more reliable and should work. Um, so you do that by editing uh, etsy-resolve.com and run that command to change the name server. Um, now if you do an apt update, uh, it should work. Cool. Uh, 
so on this machine, um, it comes with bare Ubuntu, not many tools. So we're going to install a few things. So apt install, uh, let's say nmap, and let's try x11 tools, I think is what I want. And we'll start with those two. X11 tools. Okay, cool. Uh, app install xis, x11 apps. All right. All right. So that installs nmap, the network scanner, which can only be done on Windows uh, WSL version 2, and x11 apps, which is a graphical utility. Um, that you normally can't run without an X11 server. Um, I don't think I have mine running right now, but I'll run that in a second. So of course, if I wanted to nmap something, um, nmap, right, 1.2.168.1.1. Uh, that's my router, it's been nmapped now. And that's running within my Ubuntu distribution, not on my host. Um, my host does have nmap installed, so it's not a best example, um, but it is worthy to note that this is running in essentially a Linux VM, lightweight VM on my host. Um, another thing I just installed was XIs. Um, that is a graphical utility that if we try to run it now, um, can't open display, right? What does that mean? It means the X client cannot connect to the X11 server because there is no server running uh, yet. So on my machine, I've installed uh, before this an X11 server. The one I use is VC, XSRV, right? Um, I'll drop, uh, I'll run that and then drop that in Zoom chat so you can download that yourself if you wanted to get the setup uh, running yourself. Well, that's the one. I don't know, it's complicated. What's the name? VC, I'll make it up. VC XSRV, I think. Uh, yeah, got that right. So that's now running on my local machine. So to connect to that, I have to use a the IP address of my computer to export the display there. So I have to change the environment variable of the display in Linux to my machine. Uh, what does that mean? On my Windows machine, I have to get my IP address. So I'll do IP config, browse to one that I'm connected to. And my IP address for my ethernet is 192.168.10.10. So the command for that in Linux is export uh, the display environment variable. Uh, so that equals to 192.168.10.10 uh, colon zero to basically say display zero. Uh, Jeffrey, can you really choco install XV? You know, I wouldn't be surprised. Cool. So like, if you want to do this yourself, uh, just use chocolatey. <laughs> That'll do it all for you. So I've exported the display now um, as a variable. This may cause an issue once you're on a graphical app, depending on your Windows firewall. Um, you will have to play with that to allow the XCXSRV application to communicate with your firewall. Um, it would prompt you the first time you open it to allow it through, and you just do that. So now that I have the display configured, I see able to run graphical applications. So XIs, uh, XIs does now show up on my screen. So I'll expand this because the window's weird. I can't even see the edges because that, there we go. So I can grab the toolbar. So XSize is an application um, where the eyes will follow your mouse, uh, I guess as like a, a fun game or a, or a debug tool or for applications just like this to demonstrate X11 forwarding. So XSize is not installed on my Windows machine, yet it comes up like a normal application on my Windows taskbar. It, it just works as it would. So I can expand that to other things as well. So if I wanted to on my Linux distribution, I can apt install, let's say, is Opera browser a valid thing? No, app install Chromium is, if I can spell Chromium. No, how do you spell? I don't know. App install Firefox, I don't know how to spell that one. Uh, I think on a different distro, Chromium may be there, or I'm just misspelling it entirely, which is both possible. So with the display variable set, I can then run applications, any application that would use the X11 system. So this should install fairly quickly, more installing fun stuff. I'll wait for that to go by. And there's even more cool things you can do with this. Um, 
more specifically with development on Linux, I do a lot of like Docker stuff and coding stuff. So I can do that on Linux, whereas I don't have those tools on, on Windows. So I now have Firefox on my Ubuntu installation. So I, if I run Firefox, uh, it now opens Firefox on my computer. But again, not my Firefox, it's Firefox essentially on a Linux VM. So if I wanted to do more things, I can say, open a different window. Um, I should have then pushed the background actually. So Firefox, I think ampersand pushes the background and now I have Firefox running and my terminal is still available to type. Um, so now I have welcome to Firefox, right? In my Linux distribution. Unfortunately, I don't think audio works, uh, but I, it is running fairly quickly. There is no lag here. I'll go to YouTube, click a random video. Uh, of course, lo-fi, hip-hop, radio, beats to relax, last study too, everyone's favorite. My browser doesn't support it. Awesome. Um, that one. It runs just fine. There's no audio on my end. It's not just you. So um, I can't hear it. It's just because I, it, I think it's either a fault of my own or of the X11 server that I'm using, or perhaps I don't fully understand X11 forwarding myself, which is all possible, but audio is not being um, carried out through this. Um, it's also possible I don't have an audio subsystem on my Linux distribution, like I don't have Pulse Audio installed or something like that, um, but I've never tried. That's just um, beyond the use case that I've used this for. I'm gonna study with this, right? I mean, it's completely unusable now. I can't listen to my lo-fi hip hop study beats to relax to. What a waste. But it does show to show that I have full UI interaction uh, with an application uh, running in Linux essentially. So I can install things like, angry, apt install, I think transmission to be a candidate, yes. Install XFCE. Uh, the DE environment, you mean? Uh, that won't work. <laughs> uh, I think I tried that previously, and it just like was not happy about that. I don't think you can install the full desktop environment to then get on your computer. You got it to work. OK. I was not ready to big brain that. All right. So I do have transmission. So let's install. Let's run transmission. If that's even the thing for it. Of course, it's not. Transmission, GTK. Uh, I now have transmission installed. Uh, yeah, yeah, I agree. I can now download all of the Linux ISOs that I want and nothing else. Um, but I do now have, of course, a graphical application on Linux running on what appears to be a Windows system. Even the little icon for transmission carries through. So if you look at my taskbar, uh, it's just a normal application running on my computer. Uh, there is... Uh, Transmission right there. You won't even know that's running in Linux. Um, of course, on my system, it's not there. I don't have it installed, but I was able to app install it with this. And it's really cool to be able to get programs like that that are only available on Linux. Um, transmission, I believe, is available on both. But of course, any application you could run on, on Linux, you can now essentially run on, on Windows. So the use cases for this doesn't exactly stop here. Um, I can even run services on this computer or on the Linux distribution rather. So let me clear some things up. I'll need that for later. I'll post that, okay. So all I have now is my Linux terminal that's running Ubuntu. So I do believe I need Docker. So let me go through the installation process for that. Uh, it should take just a minute. Um, Cause this is a fresh install, has nothing on it. Uh, not Windows, Linux. Cause I am on Linux, even though I'm running on, on Windows, right? It is at the full Linux kernel. Um, why can I not find Ubuntu? Uh, Unsalt, no. Installation methods, here we go. <coughs> Excuse me. So to install Docker, we run those commands. So it takes just a minute. Yeah, yeah, run those. Uh, install the GPG key, which basically means, hey, uh, trust the repository I'm, I've added. OK. Great feedback. Uh, sudo apt key fingerprint verifies it. I trust that it worked. I'm going to then add the repository. Takes a second. I'm then going to sudo apt update to cast that repository to get the packages in there. And then I will install Docker. 
And Docker, if you're not familiar with it, is a containerization tool that allows you to basically install applications, not on your host, but as a container running on your host. And this only works with WSL version two because it is a full Linux kernel. So I can quickly spin up development environments that I would on a Linux server, but on my host machine in a Linux environment, even though I'm not running Linux. So I can install things like the full Kali suite of tools and stuff like that if I wanted to. Um, it would also make Windows Defender very, very angry because all of a sudden I now have all the malware on my computer and the Windows Defender doesn't like that and freaks out and gets real angry. I think that's an issue fixed with WSL2 because it doesn't have direct access to the file system, but that is something to keep in mind of just in case. Um, you can set up an exclusion for WSL um, on those files. So once Docker is installed, um, we can begin using Docker as you normally would, right? So while that runs, um, how does this actually interact with the file system? Um, it runs with a virtual disk on your computer. But if I wanted to modify files in here and access them across machines or my Windows to Linux, how would I do that, right? So in your Explorer, right? Um, tac tac uh, WSL dollar sign. I now have the Ubuntu distribution that's currently running. If I spin up my Debian one or my Kali one, um, it should then populate here with those. So these are my different Linux distributions that I can access. Um, so Debian, that's my Debian file system. Ubuntu, they all look the same, but trust me, they're different. I've got nothing on it. Um, that's Kali, that's Debian. I'll go to Ubuntu and um, home to Risi, right? So home to Risi. I can then say nano uh, file.txt. Hello, get something there. And it should pop it there. We now have the file accessible from Linux. Uh, like the file on the Linux system is now available on my Windows computer as well. So we can communicate files that way and vice versa. Um, Pulse or Elsa, I think you're referring to audio. I'm not actually sure, I've not tried it. Um, I don't think, unless X11 forwarding does support audio, because this is essentially a virtual machine. So my audio drivers would not pass through to that VM. Um, so there is no, let's say, audio device on this computer. Um, LS PCI, nothing there. Um, LS dev. So yeah, but I don't think audio is gonna work in there, but it's not exactly the main use case for it. Um, but I can modify this file entirely on Windows. And of course it does run, um, interesting, it didn't actually update. Huh. That's interesting. Uh, wow. There we go, it's there. I don't know what happened, maybe it took a second to update. Um, but now it's actually, oh, I'm just blind. I didn't put a new line there. It's been that the whole time. Cool. All right, so uh, that's just where I had access uh, files across both. Um, my Windows machine is also accessible from Linux, accessible via the mount directory. So LS uh, MNT on any Linux distribution will show the drives that I have mounted. Um, so I have one called, I have two drives on my computer, one called C, one called G. I can LS um, MNT C. That's now my Linux, uh, I'm sorry, my Windows file system. Make it a little cleaner. Um, so we can see my C uh, users, C Windows folder on Linux. Uh, LS, I'll do, even do a CD to change directories. Mount C users desktop. Um, that's my desktop. So I can now have full access to files, touch file, files I'm on my desktop. And this is all within the Linux VM. And it's useful for things um, for like coding or, or development work. So I should probably now get to the Docker because I did install that. So Docker pull nginx. Uh, and I had to first start the Docker service because it was just installed. Service start Docker. Service. Docker start, that's the one. Uh, Docker now is running. Yeah, you can't see all the ownership too for the LS command and all that. 
Um, WSL is pretty great. So Docker version, Docker version 1903, that's I think the latest one. So Docker pull Nginx. It's going to download the Nginx container from the Docker Hub um, and get me an image to use. So we'll go through this and then we'll move on to a really cool bit. That's actually my favorite use of WSL because it's actually amazing. Um, Docker run Nginx tag P to publish report 8080 to, I think I'm doing this right, tag D maybe. I'll probably have to move it around, except not exact, what? Tag P not found. Uh, it has to go after. Okay, that should work. Uh, Docker, yes. So what that does is Docker run, runs the image of Nginx I've downloaded and I'm publishing port 8080 to port 80 in the container. Uh, that's the web stuff. So Docker PS. Um, on my Linux distribution, I'm now running a Nginx container um, listening on port 8080 localhost. So what this should allow me to do is then access localhost 8080 and I have access to Nginx now running on my Linux instance. Uh, my Windows computer is not running Nginx. My Windows computer is not running Docker, but I can use all those tools of Linux um, from my Windows workstation without actually creating a Linux VM. Um, I even have other distributions as well, such as Kali. Doesn't have many tools on it, but I don't think this one has Docker. So I have now Ubuntu and Kali Linux, one with Docker, one without. So they're completely isolated from each other, which is pretty cool. Um, and the best use case of this, uh, I think, that I've used it previously in the past for is like some of my class assignments where I have to do some programming with that. So this is cool and all, but how does that get even better, right? Um, I'm going to set up Visual Studio Code, which I have installed already. Uh, probably can do that with Choco as well. So Visual Studio Code has a lot of interactions and plugins um, with stuff, right? So one of the things you can go is download an extension for this called uh, remote development, remote, just remote, remote WSL is one of them, right? I have that installed. It comes with a pack of all that cool stuff. So what this allows you to do is get a Visual Studio, connect your Visual Studio, sorry, Visual Studio Code instance to your WSL container. So with that, I will go to Remote Explorer. I'll move on to WSL targets. And here's my WSL that I have installed. Uh, the Ubuntu one I just made. So let me connect to WSL. Open to new window. Um, opening remote, doing some downloading server stuff. And this gives you basically a more graphical experience with WSL. And this is all on the um, things that I've, <clears throat> what's the word? All of the Ubuntu instances that I've created just now. Uh, this is all fresh, none of this was pre-staged. Uh, Tupperware, what are you posting? Please don't be malware. Um, <clears throat> so we've got a binary there. Sending files. Yeah, don't, well, don't, don't, don't click on links, people. <laughs> you should run this. I don't think I will. Um, sorry, I don't trust you. That's bad practice. Um, but on this, I can install Docker. Um, so I do have Docker installed. Um, I don't think it's set up right now, however. Um, but it should work. I installed the Docker extension. My bad. Command not be used in remote session. Cool. It worked before. Very sad. But if it did work, we'll move over to actual uh, WSL close connection. I'll open a new one that does work. Uh, that's on host. I don't have installed extensions. Let me try that one. Let me go to Debian and connect to WSL. Favorite use case. Yeah, it does run. It does do very cool stuff. Does Docker work on here? Uh, Debian doesn't have it installed. Debian. Uh, sudo service docker start. And there we go. So I can now visually access those Docker containers from VS Code and run stuff like that. Now, if you're not using Docker stuff, that's not a whole lot of use, but it is very useful to be able to access VS Code stuff from your WSL container, as you can see in the corner. I do have WSL installed. So on this machine, um, on my Debian I'm now at, um, I do believe I have GCC. I do. 
So what I can do in here is essentially open a folder, uh, home, not home, open my home folder. Yeah. So now from here, I now have access to the file system on the left side and that's other stuff. Cool. Um, I have access to the terminal of WSL on the, on the bottom screen, it is running bash. The file system on my left side and in the main, of course, if you use the S code before, it's just a fancy code editor. So on here, I'll touch uh, file uh, dot C. And it should show up here as there, right? So what I can run here is basically, I can develop code for assignments and stuff like that, where if you wanna run something on Eustace um, and you feel the need to do that there, but you don't have access to a Linux machine, you can do that with WSL and run it just as you would Eustace. Of course, I'm not advocating for not running things on Eustace. If something doesn't work on Eustace, uh, that's on you. Uh, I'm just gonna say that it does run the um, code just fine. So real quick, int main, it's been a hot minute, not, wow. Uh, int, uh, don't even need that. Print F, uh, hello world. Can I write C code on the fly that I haven't done for like over a year? Uh, I also have to include uh, ST, yeah, standard yeah, IO. Uh, that's close enough. Uh, need to return. Yeah. So run into VM. Uh, I'm not tempted to run it just to see what happens. Um, GCC file uh, return with no value, even though it's void, because it's not void. C is hard. All right. Edit out. Hello world, right? So that's running all on my Linux instance. I can GCC and run things just as the instructions would for an assignment. So I've access to the code and, and here as well. And of course, I wanted to access that. I can go here, check out WSL, dollar sign, to the Debian instance. Uh, it's in my home directory, uh, Mike. Uh, there's my file.c and my a.out. out. And I can, of course, take that out and take it as is. Um, there was that a.out file. I'm not running that. Sorry, Tupperware. Uh, I'm not that risky. I'm not doing that live. All right, so that's kind of a lot of the use cases for WSL. Um, it's great to have Linux tools at your disposal on Windows. Uh, it's There's the joke that now Windows is my favorite Linux distribution because it now does um, come with a full Linux kernel, which is pretty cool. Um, I'm, Daniel, I'm not running that on Docker. I don't know what no connection it has. I don't trust it at all. Um, the containment for um, this, of course, is uh, it, it does have network access. It does have file system access to my hard drive. So it's not completely segmented as much as a VM. But if you're doing it for development and not doing sketchy stuff like running random software, um, it should be very useful and more than a few cases that you need for a lot of things. Um, on my Kali, I believe on my Kali box, it doesn't come with any tools, but you can install MSF console. So from my Kali instance on my Windows computer, I now have the full thing of Metasploit on my computer that I can do for like hack the box stuff if I wanna do open viewing clients and stuff like that. So you don't longer have to have a full VirtualBox installation or a Hyper-V or all that stuff to run these tools. Um, of course, running Metasploit on your host box probably isn't the best case scenario uh, to kind of like have those tools just on your host, but hey, uh, it's what I do. So, that's kind of all I've got for that demo. It is a lot that you can do with WSL, but like, hey, if you wanna do Linux, but at the same time, don't wanna run Linux, here's what you got. Um, does anyone have any questions about WSL2 and its component parts and stuff I've gone over? I'm not running that file, buddy. Sorry. Yeah, you can run applications with it, even the graphical ones, as long as you set up an X11 server. Um, the X, the XC, XVRC, whatever, I don't know the acronym, but you can install just about any X11 server and it should work, but I've never done it. You want XFCE, okay. Um, that'll take an hour. apt install XFCE. I know what to locate, oh no. Um, this is tough. Uh, 
uh, you have to you're gonna have to also pseudo it to run IRC. Um, no, Jake, <laughs> I'm not. Um, yeah, never mind. Uh, I three. I don't even think that's a. Apt. Can you see? Can you hear those angry Windows noises? Can I? Because I sure can. Apt install. Typing's hard. And you've been doing it for a while. Uh, yeah, 13 megabytes. Uh, sure. Oh, it doesn't work. It's angry, you know. Sorry, Daniel. Did my DNS die again? Is that what happened? Uh, uh, I think it has. That is an issue with WSL, unfortunately. There is a way to do it. I think you edit uh, etcwsl.conf. It's not there. I hope you all can't hear those beeps, because I can. Um, nano etcresolve.conf. It changed it back to the broken one. Again, this may work on your uh, your machine, but mine, either my firewall config is too, too strict or, or it's just broken. I don't really know. But we'll install R3, we'll run that, and we'll close it out. Uh, I don't think I3 is going to work. What's the command to even run the thing? Is it just I3, Daniel? Or do you not know because it's automatic on your Windows box or Linux box? He doesn't know, does he? <laughs> uh, I3. Cannot open display. Uh, run the X server in full screen though for best results. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, export display. Display display equals one nine two one six eight ten dot ten. Display is zero. Is that what broke? I three. Another one of mine just seems to be running. Um, maybe my X server runs its own window manager. And therefore, I can't run a Windows Manager inside a Windows Manager. That's my best guess. Um, I don't know. I'm not a I'm not a Linux uh, super user or power user. So, yeah, sudo it. Uh, I am sudo, but yeah, I don't think I don't think we're gonna get a full desktop on Windows on Linux working today. If you really want one, install a VM and you'll get your full Linux. But this lets you run a lot of Linux stuff on Windows. So. Any other questions about this? Yes, and I could do that, but I think uh, I don't think it's a, uh, a, a, a Linux thing doing my resolve.conf. I think it's like a Windows overlord, like touching the WS elements, like this is the new file. Kind of like a cloud in it almost, I think. Looks like more work than just installing a Ubuntu on a VM. If you want the full setup, it may be, but Ultimately, all you have to do is go to the Windows Store, click on Ubuntu, like store Ubuntu, right? Or what's the word? SUS, right? I want OpenSUS. Uh, OpenSUS, that one, install. Um, and, it, and I just install that. I don't want to do it right now, but you could. Um, once you set it up once, you can then get all the stores you want. But uh, it's not a replacement for a VM. It is there's some things you can do on a VM that you simply cannot do here, like that full desktop environment or full segmentation for security. Yeah, it essentially is a VM. Yeah, it depends on what you want. Like if I just run a one Docker real quick and like spin up a Docker image, like, hey, that's a cool Nginx container. Let me just quickly pull that on, on WSL because I don't want Docker on my host machine. It's just that more stuff I have to install. But when, I, when I'm done for the day, I can uh, head over to the... Uh, I can close this out, right? Close up VS Code because it's connected. Both of them, of course. Um, Ubuntu, uh, right click, uninstall Ubuntu, done. Uh, that instance is blown away now. So it's it's basically a VM. I mean, all that stuff I app installed, um, it's not there anymore. So Ubuntu is still there, but I think Windows hasn't got the hint yet. It was the wrong one. WSL, best. Debian and Kali. So a food is gone. Um, uh, don't run random files, please. Okay. Any other questions? We'll go ahead and uh, close it out if uh, 
none are presented. Uh, appreciate that. Thank you. All right, I think I've talked enough today. Um, whatever makes, yeah. All right, so I'll go ahead and uh, switch over to uh, to the closing. So let me go back to uh, this, uh, present full screen. That didn't do at all what I wanted it to do. Uh, okay, demonstration, okay. Uh, this is the point where I would thank the main speaker for talking, but it's myself, so I won't do that. Um, so instead, I'll thank everyone here for listening to me go on for what was like almost an hour now, at least an hour, uh, going on WSL and all that stuff. So thank you everyone for showing up um, and listening to my voice. <laughs> um, well, do that to yourself, um, of course. So uh, as always, um, we will be on a Discord. We do have a website. It will be being modified very shortly. So that is going to be under a redesign. And of course, do not forget, it will be announced uh, more than once. We still have that t-shirt design competition going on. So if you uh, want to be creative, or if you want to just share your dank memes with everyone and put them on a t-shirt, and you think it's quality enough to go for HackBCF, um, reach out to search at hackbcf.org um, for questions and submissions. And we'll work with you to get that going. So did the budget pass? Great question. I almost forgot because I've been going on too long. Um, well, let me pull that up on here. Y'all can look at this window while I do that. Uh, almost forgot. Thank you, Jeffrey. Uh, he's old. Technical difficulties. Um, do you can get Jeffrey music? Uh, yeah, yeah. He's just reminding me to vote when I sign in. Uh, we have our own election that's more important, and it's the budget. Uh, events. One moment. Ah, where am I going? Uh, my goodness, Addison, pull it up, please, if you can. Um. I'm having great difficulty navigating to the window uh, for some reason. It said, the, it said the stats. Did you say the stats? Oh, seven to zero votes, 100% pass rate. Okay. Thank you everyone for voting that. Um, I don't have to finagle with this anymore. Cool, cool. Okay. Thank you, Jeffrey. Both two confirmed. So cool, cool. I just kind of pull it up right now. I was doing a lot of things open. So um, budget did pass. We do now have that $300 allocated budget. And for the hoodies as well, um, we'll have more information about distribution. Um, as we approach the um, election day for those, not election day, but the voting day for the t-shirt competition. Um, if anything, they would be available by late, this like mid to late December. And at that point, it's gonna be the holiday season and things are gonna be weird. So as usual, we'll look around, uh, look around for that stuff in the early spring. Um, anything changes, we'll, we'll let you know, of course. Um, the CTF workshop is tomorrow. Um, for reverse engineering. Um, it will go over kind of how a binary works, how programs work, the memory allocation, and how to exploit those and, and look like, learn about stuff like that. Cool, cool. Um, you're welcome, Alex. So any other questions um, for today? Otherwise, we'll close this out. That's a lot of words. Yep, all right. Um, okay. My brain is just about mush for today. So one last thank you to everyone for coming and staying. Um, we'll see you on the Discord and we'll see you hopefully on Saturday, if not next week, okay? All right, everyone, uh, have a good one. Uh, see you next week.